All right. Okay. Thank you everybody for being here uh, at this session today, where we're very excited to announce a brand new uh, fellowship. Uh, but before we uh, get started, let me um, uh, actually go back to our initial slide and start again. There we are. Sorry for the glitch. You would think by now we're pros, but we're not. All right. So before I get started with the actual topic of the session, I would like to remind you uh, that this conference uh, has a code of conduct. Uh, you agreed to abide with it when you registered. Uh, you can refresh your memory by going to the workshop um, website and click on the code of contact as shown here. Also, a couple of other reminders. Uh, the talks are being recorded. Uh, if you would like to keep yourself off camera, you're welcome, of course, to do that. Uh, the video of the whole session will be posted the next working day at some point, so you can always access, access it or share with others if you'd like to. Um, let me also say that we will, of course, we have a Q&A session at the end. Uh, please, um, unless you have questions for clar clarification, uh, try most of your questions to keep them for the end. Uh, you can type, though, already during the session your questions both in the chat of the Zoom session or in the Slack channel that you can find in the website for this session in the workshop schedule. If a Slack question or, or chat question reappears and you like it, it's one of your questions, you can give it a thumbs up and then I will give priority to questions that have more uh, thumbs up. So I think with this in mind, we're ready to get started. So it's a pleasure uh, for me again to welcome you to this session. Uh, we're all very excited in the team that has worked for a long time uh, to make some of this a reality. Uh, this session is for the fellowship, but I would like to connect it to a session we had yesterday. Some of you were probably there. We had a session uh, discussing the LINK initiative. Um, and I will not repeat anything from that session, only to say that this fellowship that we'll discuss today is actually a part of the LINK initiative. Many people have worked on the LINK initiative um, uh, over many years. Uh, yesterday, we announced one part of the LINK initiative that is now uh, becoming reality and will be launched. And today in this session, we're happy to uh, announce the uh, LSSDC Catalyst Fellowship funded by the John Templeton Foundation. Uh, for the session, you will, um, and please, if you are not talking, if you can mute, please, I would appreciate it. Uh, so for the session, we have planned uh, a short presentations by a number of people, uh, a core announcement by Jeno Sokolowski, who represents the LSST Corporation and Columbia. Uh, then um, uh, some comments from Amir Ali from the John Templeton Foundation. We'll get more fellowship details from Jeno as well. And then you'll hear about two, three elements uh, related to the fellowship by Jean Davenport, University of Washington, Masao Sacco, University of Pennsylvania, and Iman Gumiri from Lawrence Livermore National Lab. Uh, then we'll go to the Q&A part of the session and we'll be happy to answer any questions you have. So I will ask again for people who are not muted, who are not talking to mute, please, if you can hear me. And uh, no, I am ready to pass it on to Jeno, but we'd like to have quiet time when the announcement is being made. Let me see. Does the host have the ability to mute people? Uh, I am not the host. Who is the host of this officially? Because I think we need that power. Yeah, it looks like Michael. Michael Schneider, are you there? I need to mute. No, no, no. Also, Herman, Herman Stockbrand. 
Herman Stockbrand, please mute. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Okay. Michael Schneider, please mute. Dara Norman, please mute. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. Henry right. Heesh, please mute. Thank you. One more here, Henry. Are we all good, Pat? I think so. There's there's a couple not muted, but they're not speaking. So, so okay. far. All right. Well, uh, thank you for everybody's cooperation. Uh, as I said, I will now, uh, I'm just moderating the session. Uh, I am part of the team, but our leader is Jenna Sokolowski. So I'm going to pass it on to her. She is the PI of the grant we're going to talk about and the director of our program. So Jenna, go ahead. Thank you very much, Vicki. As you all know, Ruben LSST brings with it uh, potential for enormous change. That's change in the way we view the universe, change in the way astronomers interact with data, and change in the way we collaborate with each other. So with this fellowship that we're very excited to announce at this year's project and community workshop, our goal is to take advantage of this very special point in time where we are right now, right before the beginning of this 10-year survey, and we want to catalyze these positive changes with this fellowship. So we are interested in uh, ensuring vigorous discovery during the first years of the survey and throughout the survey in a broad through from a broad sector of the population. We're interested in catalyzing as well the and facilitating the successful use of big data. And of course, also training young people, new leaders who will help our community thrive in these new collaborations. Now, before I go over the details of this new fellowship, I would like to introduce Amir Ali. And before I start that, can we, can someone confirm? Uh, yes, Amir is here. Thank you. And I agree that we should. Um, Figure out who the host is so that we can mute people. All right, so I'll go ahead. Uh, wait a second, Amir, I haven't introduced you yet. So Amir is uh, an experimental cosmologist with um, degrees from Caltech and Johns Hopkins and experience as a Simons Observatory uh, postdoctoral scholar at UC Berkeley. And Amir has been immensely helpful in us getting this project. So through the process of proposing and revising, submitting proposal and revising it to the Templeton Foundation, um, Amir was there for us and so, this fellowship is better because of his involvement. And we want to very much thank Amir and the Templeton Foundation for their investment in us, in Rubin Science and the Rubin Science community. So, all right, take it away, Amir. All right, jump the gun the first time. <laughs> Thanks for, uh, for catching that. Uh, and thank you so much for the kind introduction. Uh, a bit, a bit generous, I would say, but I'll, but I'll take it. Um, it first off, uh, first and foremost, I want to start by congratulating the LSSTC and the Rubin community on being awarded this grant. And uh, in general, for everything that's up ahead, uh, we're really excited. Everyone at the foundation is really excited about the observatory, uh, what it's going to mean for astrophysics and astronomy. Uh, and we're really thrilled to be what we see as the ground floor sort of in supporting this postdoctoral program. Uh, and we see it hopefully as being crucial not only to the immediate successes of the Rubin Observatory, but also for the future um, of ASTRO and investing in, post, in postdocs, uh, who we see will likely be the leaders in the Rubin Observatory in the future and ASTRO at large. Uh, 
So um, <clears throat> since Zoom sessions are, of course, the times when you have a captive audience and nobody can ever be distracted, I'll uh, absolutely take advantage of that, uh, your undivided attention, uh, and tell you a little bit about the foundation. Uh, but especially our interest in math and physical sciences, my, my department, that's where I'm the PO. Um, and a small hint is if you are interested in applying for funding, hopefully this will be slightly useful for you. So I'll do a little bit of a foundation pitch um, if you'll indulge me. Um, so our founder, our founder was Sir John Templeton. He was a Tennessee native turned Rhodes Scholar, turned Wall Street investor, turned avid Bahamian resident who was dubbed a night bachelor in 1987 by the queen. Uh, in that year, he founded the John Templeton Foundation. Uh, so the, our foundation supports research on some of the biggest, deepest, and most fundamental questions, reflecting his commitment to intellectual humility and discovery. And this is actually one of my favorite quotes from him. Uh, humility is a gateway to discovery. To learn more, we must first realize how little we already know. In spite of tremendous scientific breakthroughs in recent times, there can still be a vast, possibly infinite amount of knowledge to be learned. So that idea of a vast amount of knowledge yet to be learned is really a key part of our vision to support research and learning, not only in MPS, but in many disciplines. As you see in some of the details I put here on the right, uh, we have grants all over the place. Um, we've studied subjects from black holes and evolution to creativity, forgiveness, free will, across all sorts of disciplines, math, physics, genetics, philosophy, but also cultural evolution, anthropology, psychology, many others. But to zoom in a little bit on MPS, uh, I just wanna give you an idea of what some of our goals are. And you'll see that reflected in, in this grant as well, I believe. So our first goal in MPS is to advance the scientific understanding of the nature of the physical world, pushing new conceptual frontiers. So what we're really after here is fundamentality. We've always had a really strong interest in new ways of thinking, the biggest questions, and those are the sorts of areas that we're interested in exploring and, support, and supporting. Our second goal is to clarify our understanding of the scientific endeavor by examining concepts of human reason, logic, and truth. So what we're after here is sort of a meta-reflection on the scientific endeavor as a whole. You know, what does it say about human thought in broad terms? You know, in what ways do the scientific concepts that we might discover in the first goal how does that challenge our understanding of how we do science or how we think as human beings? Now, the third goal is one I think doesn't get enough play. Um, that goal is expanding humanity's perspective on its place in the world and inspiring a sense of awe and wonder. You know, I think sometimes, especially in the public, science has this bad rap of being kind of cold and calculating. And of course, on the one hand, science can be very concrete and precise. I don't think it gets its due in terms of how interesting and exciting it can be. Uh, and we wanna to try to counter that. Uh, and I think it's a frankly inaccurate characterization. I think we're all in science because one way or another, we're excited by it. And the way we propose to do that is really emphasizing this idea of having people reflect on what we have learned about the universe, the very big, the very small, uh, everything in between, what's left to learn uh, and tap back into this kind of natural curiosity and wonder and excitement that people have especially young people. Uh, and we really hope that they will be attracted to science through this approach. So you'll see a lot of this reflected in any of the various science, science outreach work that we fund. The fourth one is to build capacity among MPS scientists to engage in interdisciplinary conversations, allowing them to bring their MPS work and expertise to bear on broader issues of shared concern. So here, what we're trying to think is, you know, without distracting anybody from their main interests and main expertise, it's really a shame if specialization leads to siloing and leads to people not being able to engage in fruitful conversations across disciplines. Um, and, you know, MPS has so much to say uh, and the kinds of skills that we have in MPS are relevant to so many fields. And a really good example of this is, you know, even just in COVID response. I mean, on the one hand, you're dealing with really clinical virology type questions, but then you have statistics and epidemiology, behavioral sciences, and then you have to think about maybe even advertising and marketing and fields that you wouldn't even think of in terms of the sciences. But if you want to come up with a COVID response, you have to somehow play with all of those. 
not saying I have any interesting, you know, ideas on that, but just to bring the point that ultimately, you know, some of the biggest conversations require a facility to be able to speak to people uh, in multiple languages, so to speak. And the last thing I want to say about this is just uh, keep these four goals in mind as you look through some of what's going to be presented. I'm not going to, you know, sort of tip the hand of the presenters coming after me uh, on, you know, the work that they're, their own work that they're going to be presenting. Uh, but I really do think that uh, this proposal is a really good exemplar of all four of these. Uh, and I think this is actually, uh, this proposal is actually an example of a project that came in that had ideas and a vision that was really aligned with what we're trying to do in MPS at the foundation. But I like to think that to a certain extent, you know, we were also able to help inspire and motivate the final form of the project. And we hope that was ultimately for the better. Uh, so the last bit on our topics of interest in MPS, these are sort of our three main topics of interest at the moment, uh, cosmology, quantum foundations, and emergence complexity. Um, and I've just listed, this is obviously not exhaustive at all, just a few examples of the kinds of topics we might be interested under each. But there's also topics sort of in between. We're also really interested in the in-between kind of questions. So, you know, cosmology, cross quantum, okay, things like inflation and so forth. And then, you know, something that hits a little bit of all three, you know, areas of quantum gravity that explore quantum information, holography, et cetera. There's a, we're really interested in the intersections as well. A quick rundown of our calendar, just because this might actually be relevant. So our deadline for open submissions, if, in case you're interested in getting money and who isn't, um, August 20th uh, is our deadline for open funding inquiries. That, the bad news is that that's 10 days away. The good news is that it's a really short pre-proposal. It should be very doable unless you're completely have no ideas. Um, it should be doable to put in something for that. And, and if it's a good idea, we'll sift through those. Um, that takes a little bit of time. And then we'll invite for full proposals, usually in Q4. At that point, that's a little bit more of a commitment. You do a regular full proposal at the usual 10 to 15 page-ish length, you know, typical NASA, NSF level of detail. Uh, and that's typically due around January uh, and then it'll go through a few rounds of internal and external review. Uh, the folks that worked on this grant can tell you all about that. Uh, and one part of that that's actually helpful, I think, and hopefully they would say the same, is that we have a bounce system where we actually send back our comments. Uh, it, typically, a proposal wouldn't, unless it's definitely not going to fly, it, it typically wouldn't just get uh, rejected offhand. There's typically an opportunity to response to respond to referee comments. Uh, and sometimes also incorporate the suggestions, which occasionally are, are actually extremely helpful. Uh, and then final decisions go out in June. And that has, it. for a full for an invited full proposal, the approval rate is somewhere between a third to 50%. I think the last couple of years it's been around 50%. So I'll just end on a uh, semi-personal note here. Uh, as mentioned, uh, as Jenna mentioned, I was a uh, postdoc until pretty recently on the Simons Observatory. So here's a very flattering picture of me uh, next to the small aperture telescope I worked on. Uh, and then one from my grad school days uh, when I was deployed in Chile for the class telescope that's just over the hill from Alma. Uh, so not all that far from where VRO is. Uh, and I'm actually only one of two physicists on staff at MPS. I have, my boss is more senior to me uh, and is, is a quantum optics guy by training actually. Um, so I can say, you know, I, on my own behalf, personally, on behalf of my colleagues at MPS and everybody at the foundation, uh, even the board was really, you know, really excited about this initiative. Uh, I can say we're really invested in helping this to be a successful program, and we want to do our best as funders, not only to fund the science, but also to be responsible stewards. And you'll hear a bit about that with regards to some of the innovative aspects of this fellowship that we really valued, like the extensive mentorship and the inclusion of the social sciences. So I'll just say, you know, on behalf of the foundation, I'd like to again congratulate and thank the LSSTC, not only for all their past service, uh, you know, contributing to the Rubin Observatory, but for now being our partners on the ground and administrators for this program. We have every confidence that this will be a great success and we can't wait to see what all of you discover about our universe. Thanks so much. Great. Thank you, Amir. Thanks a lot for your 
uh, interest in this project uh, and all your support along the way. So now I'll turn it to Geno, who will give a lot more of the details of the program. Right, so and now, Pat, will you share the slides? It's the present, yeah. Great, thanks, Pat. And before I start, I'd actually like to just respond to one thing Amir said, which was about the difference in the experience of applying for um, a, a large grant from the Templeton Foundation versus something like a NASA grant or an NSF where it's a big closed door at the federal agencies and you just get a, a yes and some comments and a no, and there's no process of back and forth. This was completely different and um, really wonderful actually to have the opportunity to work together to make something better and to address the comments um, and feel like we're all on the same team trying to come up with something great. Okay, good. Now moving into the details. Today for the details of the fellowship, I'm gonna focus on, um, since most of the people in the audience are astrophysicists or maybe software engineers or data scientists, um, and probably few, not any of you are social scientists, I'm gonna focus a little, much, uh, a little bit on the perspective of the astrophysicists in the room. So Pat, if you could go forward. So first, let me start by reviewing the basic parameters of the fellowship. And right off the top, I wanna to tell you that this fellowship will be competitive with other top fellowships that you are familiar with, the NASA Hubble, things like that. So it has some of the same basic parameters, complete academic freedom, given that your proposed research is related to LSST science, a competitive stipend and research allowance and annual symposia. So these are just the basic properties of a top tier uh, fellowship. For um, specific to this one, there will be five astrophysics fellows per year um, in these first two years that are funded. And I should mention, I'm talking about two cohorts um, that are fully, that are funded. And um, however, we have, um, ha based on our conversations with potential funders, we're optimistic about the program continuing. Um, but right now we'll be focusing on the first group of fellows. Our selection committee will be seeking cohorts that are excellent, diverse, and balanced. And so when I refer to, um, oh, I should start by saying the fellowships are open to all. That's all within a few years of their PhD. And that is from institutions both in the US and outside of the US. And in this particular context, what I mean is there are no restrictions on whether your institution or country is currently a, has negotiated data rights for uh, LSST data. You're still welcome to apply for this fellowship. Um, moreover, there'll be a very wide host, a wide choice of host institutions for these for the incoming fellows. Four out of five of them will sit at. LSST member institutions. And there are actually, um, if you could go, yes, uh, LSST member institutions. There are approximately 30 such institutions, but some of them are actually consortia of multiple institutions. So the actual choice um, of institutions is significantly larger than 30 institutions for those four out of five fellows. One of the astrophysics fellows will sit at what we're calling an expansion site. So the expansion sites can in principle be any institution in the US, but our intent with these sites is consistent with the message that's been coming through this whole meeting and at our discussion uh, on link yesterday is about really broadening the impact and access of LSST and access to LS discovery with LSST data. So we envision those expansion sites being small or uh, minority serving or historically underserved institutions. And our partnerships task force is working with some institutions um, that fall into that category. And so for applicants, there'll be a list of those 
on the website that already have established that they are capable of hosting postdocs and that they're excited to receive an LSST fo focused postdoc. Um, although applicants can certainly find other institutions like that on their own. So next slide, please. Okay, so the basic features are competitive with some of the top prize fellowships. Um, but this one has some additional special features, and these speak to some of the goals that Amir mentioned. So first of all, this fellowship is cross-disciplinary. For um, in addition to the 10 astrophysics fellows that will be funded in the first two years, we will also select two to four social science fellows. And um, like with the astrophysicists, we don't know exactly what this, they'll study because they'll submit applications and they'll have a research plan. And, uh, but we anticipate that these will be um, social science research related to the Rubin LSST community, the specific fellows that are working on astrophysics, but also the broader community, including the science collaborations, member institutions, and LINK itself. So those social scientists will investigate the practice of astronomy in the era of big data, team science, how to build inclusive teams and things like that. And the astrophysics fellows will have the opportunity to work with these social science fellows and uh, um, participate in, in their uh, research as much as desired. So another special aspect of the fellowship is uh, structured collaboration, uh, structured mentoring and leadership training. So again, beyond what a typical prize fellow would get, they might get some funding that's pretty decent and then you know told to go off and do some good research, come back in three years with some nature papers. Um, here, we're gonna actually help make that happen. So we'll give you some good funding and nice timeline, but also, provide the opportunity to put together a collaboration and mentoring committee of senior researchers. Um, if you're an astronomer, mostly astronomers, but also at least one social scientist, they're gonna give you ad advice and help you um, make connections and check in kind of in a way like a, like a thesis committee for a student, but more peer to peer level. Um, we'll also provide some group flexible leadership course training courses for the cohort of fellows. Um, importantly, these co mentor collaborators will not just be giving you the dregs of what's left over of their busy schedule, um, because we're going to provide uh, several of them with small grants themselves so that they actually have the capacity to meaningful, meaningfully interact with the fellows and give them significant amount of time. Um, one of these mentor collaborators will be an active member of the science collaborations, providing a route between the fellows and these broader collaborations in the community, and maybe even a leadership role in the science collaborations, and one will be from a uh, small or um, historically under-resourced institution to help the fellow broaden their experience of how research is done. Okay, um, one fellow per cohort will also sit at one of these expansion sites that I described a bit on the first slide. So I won't go into that again in great detail, except to mention that in addition to the default three-year terms that many fellows will be offered, um, fellows who select expansion sites will be offered four-year fellowship terms. This is to enable them to um, do research fully in uh, maybe a non-traditional environment. They'll also get additional um, research funds and have their expansion site institution partnered in a mutually beneficial partnership with an LSS team member institution. Okay, next slide. Okay. So the final two special features that I wanna review for this fellowship are that it's connected to something bigger. It's connected to the LINK initiative that we described at our session yesterday. So um, as you heard yesterday, if you attended that session, there is a funded LINK software program currently where uh, researchers will be participating in LINK, will be developing platforms that will be um, beneficial for all kinds of LSST analysis. And so fellows who decide 
that they would like to be heavily engaged or maybe a little more engaged than others in that type of work, whether it's developing or beta testing um, some tools, will have the opportunity to have four-year terms at these sites so that they can also publish. They can work on tools and publish so they're set up for um, in a good place for their career path. Um, and there are several other ways the fellows will be connected to link monthly topical group meetings um, and invitations to serve on scientific organizing committees event, also supporting their career development and their leadership paths. And finally, fellows will all have um, automatic delegate status for the LSST data previews, connecting to our desire for them to be ambassadors for Rubin LSST science. Next slide. So um, you might be thinking, okay, so LSST Corporation put in this proposal to the Templeton Foundation. Um, who are these people that are designing and running this fellowship? So the answer is, if your institution is a member of LSSTC, you are. You are participating or have the opportunity to participate in designing and running this fellowship. So as a reminder, LSSTC is a nonprofit member-based organization. Um, you can think of us as a consortium of th about 30 research institutions. And those institutions pooled their resources, both financial and in terms of service, to work together to make this uh, proposal um, come to fruition and to really make this happen. So the proposal team itself was drawn from eight of those LSSTC member institutions, picking some from, uh, they included institutions both inside and from outside the US and small and large institutions, and at least one person who is a co-chair of a science collaboration. So most of those people have now transitioned to form the, the fellowship um, steering committee. So their work in designing this program and coming up with this proposal has now uh, morphed into them helping to continue to make the decisions that come up um, as people start to apply and ask questions and helping us think about, think through what's the best way to answer all those questions. Um, in particular, the leadership team was involved in helping very much with the proposal. And that's one of the, the steering committee co-chair, Vicki Calugera, who's serving as our moderator today, and also Catherine Johnston, who is not able to be here today, and myself, who's directing the program. Um, and we're also working with task forces to resolve um, several issues involved with getting the fellowship established. And those task forces include at least 25 volunteers from 16 member institutions. So this really is a community effort. And if you're thinking, I would like to be involved in some of this decision-making, it's not too late. Your, your department can still join LSST TC and be a part of um, crafting this kind of program for the community. Okay, next, Pat. This is my final slide. So just how and when to apply. We do expect applications for this first cohort to be due in November. And uh, maybe more importantly, what Jim will talk about is we'll run an Ideas Lab virtual workshop in October, probably on October 8th. And if you're interested in applying, or if you have a student or a colleague that you think might want to apply to this, you should encourage them to register for that virtual workshop that will help them learn about the fellowship and also put together a stronger application. Um, so we aim to launch our fellowship and link website in early September. So please keep an eye on the LSSTC website. It'll contain all the information um, that you're seeing here and more and registration for the Ideas Lab. And um, Thank you. And I think next will be Jim talking about the first step in the application process. Excellent. Can everybody hear me? Okay, good. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm also, I will share and echo Jenna and Amir's excitement. I think this is going to be a really, a really unique and really uh, amazing new program. I can't wait to see who our first cohort of fellows is. And to try to find that cohort, we are going to be hosting, I think, a unique sort of community engagement session that we're calling the Ideas Lab. Um, go ahead, next slide, Pat. Thank you. 
So the short summary here is that it's going to be a virtual uh, info session uh, led about a week in advance um, of the of the workshop. And then a one day virtual workshop is what we're planning on right now to bring together prospective mentors. So these are applicants, people who um, know they want uh, sorry, sorry, mentors are the people from the LSSTC member institutions that know they want to host a fellow. Uh, or from the expansion sites that are excited about hosting fellows uh, and also prospective fellows. And so we're hoping to get a large group of prospective fellows to come and give us a couple hours of their time uh, in early October so that we can talk about the fellowship, they can generate ideas, and they can have hopefully meaningful connections to new mentors. Uh, one really important facet of this is that it's a community event. This is supposed to be engaging to generate new ideas, to hopefully make connections between fellows and host institutions that they didn't expect. Um, I, would, I would love if all the fellows didn't just apply to the top few institutions, but instead made connections to the broader LSSTC community. And so we're hoping to sort of facilitate some of those connections uh, where they might be unexpected. And importantly, this is not part of the selection process. This is a community event meant to spark uh, collaboration and engagement. Uh, and nobody from the, uh, from the selection team uh, um, will be present. People like uh, me and Jenna will be present to tell you about the fellowship, but not the people who are actually selecting fellows. Uh, next slide, please. So our goals, as I said, are to introduce the fellowship to the community, uh, both through some webinars and also through just open Q&A sessions. We'd like to be able to convey the specific details, uh, like we've been talking about here today, the unique aspects of the fellowship, useful details about applications, what the materials are, things like that. Um, so we'd like people to be able to have the strongest application possible from coming to this uh, ideas lab. We'd like this to be a sort of a value added event for people to have the best applications possible. Um, and we would like the ideas lab to help generate the largest and di most diverse population of applicants that we can to get the strongest cohort of Catalyst fellows uh, in place. Um, as has already been said, we have interests in multidisciplinary uh, science across the LSST Ruben um, science landscape. And so we'd like to not just get applicants that are all in one science area, but trying to get as many different ideas into the application pool. Um, our goal is not to try to do speed dating, to not try to get fellows to chat with as many people as possible. Instead, I think the optimization is trying to get prospective fellows to have a few high quality chats, something like 20 or 30 minute chats is what I envision uh, with potential mentors. And so to do that, we'd like to facilitate connections. And so we'll have, as part of the application process, a little brief questionnaire about the interests of the fellows and the mentors will have, and we'll try to facilitate some of those connections. And again, we hope that this Ideas Lab will help uh, begin to establish the sense of community that Link is trying to build. Uh, next slide. So before the Ideas Lab, people will register. The uh, links will hopefully be live on the website soon. Um, We'll have uh, scheduled meeting times that we'll set up so people will be able to put it in their calendars. We're, because we're uh, in this virtual setting, we'll try to span and optimize time zones. Of course, it will be imperfect, uh, but we'll do our best to try to make a, a broad day, day being broadly defined in the virtual sense. Uh, and then during the Ideas Lab itself, uh, we'll host um, this webinar. There will be some uh, basic webinar stuff like this where we're conveying boilerplate information. We'll do that the week ahead. Um, and then the day of during the Ideas Lab proper, we'll have a mix of sort of short presentations, uh, things to sort of inspire people to get conversations going, uh, and then these one-on-one -on -one meetings. And we're also looking for some sort of social interactive space. This might be through a platform like Sparkle or Gather Town or something like this. We're working right now to figure out what the right platform is to get people to come together uh, and have some interactivity and not just, not just having a bunch of one-on-one -on -one Zoom calls. Uh, next slide. Um, as Jenna mentioned, we're targeting October 8th, uh, Friday, uh, as being our notional date for the Ideas Lab. The info session hopefully will be about a week before then uh, and will be recorded and posted online. So that will be just in sort of a standard Zoom webinar format. Um, and again, we're working on figuring out what the best I uh, interactive platform is. Uh, and then next slide, I think my last slide here. Um, and a plea at the end here is that we need your help. Um, if you're part of a member institution, uh, we'll be reaching out. In fact, I think some emails have already started to go out to member institutions trying to get input. Uh, if you would like to host one of these fellows, we'd like to get information from you to try to make these connections. Um, if you're interested in applying for these fellowships, the registration will open hopefully soon on the website. Um, if you think you know of a great fellow or somebody who's graduating soon, please get the word out or help make these connections for us. And if you have any thoughts, questions or comments, uh, you can send them to me. Uh, specifically about the Ideas Lab, but in general, reach out to us and we'd love to hear from the community. 
Um, and I think that's my I think that's my last slide. Yes, and so I will hand it off to uh, Masad, who will tell us about the selection process. Thanks, Jim. Can everybody hear me? Okay. Great. Um, okay, so I'll talk a little bit about the uh, sort of the behind the scenes activities going on um, on how to finalize the selection process and criteria for this uh, for this fellowship. Uh, can you advance the slide? Thank you. Uh, so we have uh, several members from LCCC member institutions who are participating in this process um, for selecting uh, for the selection uh, process and criteria, but also how to put together the review panel, uh, the committee for this uh, fellowship, which will most likely be uh, external people, but this is still uh, under discussion. Uh, we have members from uh, five of our LSSTC member institutions who are on this task force uh, that is putting together uh, um, this uh, process, uh, includes people from Columbia, Northwestern, Oxford, uh, Penn, uh, and Texas A&M. And we have faculty uh, to uh, graduate students um, participating in this process. Uh, and as Jenna mentioned, uh, our main goal is to be able to select an excellent, diverse, and balanced cohort of astrophysicists, as well as social scientists um, for this fellowship. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> okay, um, again, like I said, nothing has been set in stone at this point, but there are some um, things that we uh, sort of know what's, what's happening. Um, the application material that we will uh, ask for or expect to ask, ask for um, is probably similar to some of the uh, other prestigious fellowships like the Hubble um, and Einstein uh, fellowships with, with small differences. Um, so we'll ask for a research statement, which is pretty standard across all of these uh, applications. We will also ask for uh, what we call a community impact uh, statement, which if you're familiar with the NSF proposals, this is kind of similar to the, uh, the broader impacts statement, um, which will hopefully describe how your research and your proposed activities will impact not just your uh, own research, but a broader um, as a, a broader community uh, and you know, more people than the people who are uh, immediate collaborators. Uh, we will also uh, ask for a diversity, uh, equity, and inclusion uh, statement. <clears throat> um, we'd like to hear from applicants um, what their uh, feelings and philosophies are about uh, DEI. Uh, we will also uh, ask uh, for a letter of commitment from the first choice institution and the potential mentor of the uh, applicant. So the Ideas Lab, uh, I think, will play an important role in uh, in this, in this part of the application. And then there are other standard things like CVs, uh, list of references and uh, so forth. Um, we will uh, probably look at uh, these things that are listed on the bottom of this uh, slide um, in our selection process. Research excellence, uh, of course, is one of the most important things that we will look for, but also community impact, what um, larger, um, um, group of people, your research and uh, proposed activities will, will reach. Uh, of course, the uh, research is hopefully uh, relevant to Rubin and LCST uh, science and not on uh, JWST and other um, um, interesting science, but not related to LCST. Uh, we will also likely look at uh, the your proposed research and how that uh, could uh, nicely integrate with the host institution and more importantly with the mentor um, who will uh, um, hopefully provide um, good mentorship uh, to, to the applicant. And then of course, the passion for uh, collaborative, uh, collaborative research. LSST is so large, it's likely that a single person is not gonna be able to, uh, to do all of the um, important work. Uh, next slide, and this is uh, the last slide. Um, I think I already uh, said uh, most of these, um, but we really expect the fellows to be able to have a lot of freedom in their research, uh, hopefully make uh, major breakthroughs in the early uh, few years of LSST uh, data acquisition, and also to serve as ambassadors for LSST science. We hope that the uh, applicants have the desire to work collaboratively with other astrophysicists who are part of the research project, but also with, with the other members of the cohort, um, 
uh, including the social scientists, and to be able to work with them to make uh, LSST uh, uh, a better place for everyone to, uh, to do their work. Um, and to develop critical connections with uh, each other and with uh, scientific collaborations across the LSST community. Um, that's all I had. Uh, I'm going to pass the baton to uh, Iman. Can you hear me? Yes, okay. Uh, yes, so um, I am today covering for uh, Catherine Johnston, who is leading this partnership uh, part of the fellowship. So next slide, please. Okay, so it's a kind of a summary of what Geno said at the beginning, but I think it would be helpful to state it again. Um, so the Catalyst uh, Fellowship would have two cohorts, and she and Geno said already that we have um, five astrophysicists uh, in the fellow, and one or two fellows in social science, so it's uh, cross disciplinary. And the uh, applicant can be uh, from the U.S. or international uh, institution or expansion site, and we. Uh, focused in our uh, group on the expansion side. So the goal, why expansion side first? So uh, we want to, uh, the, we, LSSTC uh, wants to fulfill like the mission of the research and education, but also to make sure that the data, the LSST data is widely used from the scientists and undergrad to the professors for, uh, to the broader audience. So we want to reach this, uh, the population beyond like the traditional users of the survey data in academia. We mentioned the big institution, the big universities with a lot of networking and connections, but we want to uh, uh, encourage the, these expansion sites in order to integ uh, and integrate them into the LSST community. That's why we uh, specifically target uh, one fellow from the expansion site and we want to help the, build the fellow skills for working in like this broad and diverse community that maybe would not be available in its uh, original institution uh, next slide please yeah, so uh, this is just, uh, again, another summary of uh, what is proposing for the expansion side. So uh, as we said before, so first, uh, we are targeting the small institution and uh, the uh, that serve uh, underserved uh, population for colleges. So what I mean by that is, um, HBCU, uh, I, indigenous colleges, and uh, any uh, minority serving universities. Uh, the little character, the little difference that we are, uh, actually I'm going to talk to, uh, about it uh, in the next uh, slide, but what I'm saying here is just for this expansion side, this is the difference that we are proposing compared to a regular fellow from a different institu bigger institution is four years term as Geno said instead of three years uh, an additional 10k per year uh, in research fund on the top of the 25k already available and uh, we send as well support for the expansion side so the we build a partnership with, with the with the expansion side so the larger institution will be uh, partnered with the uh, with a small one, and we uh, have a 50k available in research funds over th the three years. Next slide, please. Okay, so our here we're, we're trying to explain what how do we select this expansion site. So our partnership task force uh, wants to. Uh, define basically what these expressions are. And we don't have something set on in stone. Uh, basically, we, we are uh, trying to figure out who would be a good candidate for the expansion. So I mentioned that what we want is a minority serving institution, uh, but uh, the, there are big universities, Berkeley, for example, where I am, uh, University of Berkeley uh, serve a minority um, 
students, but it has a huge department of uh, astrophysics, a lot of networks, uh, UC Santa Cruz as well. So these are not the institutions that we are targeting in the expansion side. It doesn't have to be small either, because for example, um, City University of New York is a big institution, but it doesn't have a big uh, astronomy research department there. So it's a little bit uh, uh, unclear, but in, in certain, basically the criteria that we are, we, we are thinking of is a small, it's more small department or small research activity it could be like a, a liberal arts university with like one astronomer in the physics in a small physics department, or it could be like a, a not very well connected um, astronomy uh, activity in a big in institution. So it's really not like uh, black or white, but more like uh, different cases. So uh, yeah, uh, we uh, we are right now uh, in order to to. Um, determine that what we are doing right now is discuss uh, site uh, needs with uh, consultants. So we're talking with different uh, astronomers, basically in different uh, institutions that themselves helped develop this outreach and develop like programs, uh, similar programs to kind of like help us shape the message to the specific uh, expansion sites. And our goal potentially is to um, uh, highlight and identify uh, uh, at least 10 uh, sites that would be listed as potential like host for fellows. Mm -hmm. And uh, and again, we are uh, the the message that we want to 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 be left with you is that we are constantly like we are waiting for if you know people that are uh, that would be interested or that, that have the criteria or the requirement for the expansion site please send us emails and contact us in order to um, uh, reach out to them yeah that's it thank you Iman and and thank you to all of the speakers uh, throughout the session um, we're transitioning now to our Q&A part. Uh, as I said, people can post questions in the chat or the Slack channel for this um, session, which is posted on the, uh, on the session website in the schedule. Um, okay, so maybe I'll give folks a little bit of time. I will, uh, I'd like to ask maybe the first question. Um, so one question about the ideas lab, um, are, are, it wasn't clear, um, I think, will our potential applicants expected to give presentations of maybe their past or current work uh, uh, at the ideas lab, or are they there to attend presentations from potential mentors and to mingle and discuss? I think the latter is our hope. We, we would hate for people to feel like even if we're telling them this is not required for the application and that it's not part of the decision process, that they still have to then sort of propose their work and um, and give a mini version of their dissertation talk. I think that's exactly the opposite. Instead, we okay. really like for people to have conversations um, and yeah. maybe maybe a few presentations to attend. Okay. All right. Thank you, Jim. Um... Well, if it's okay, I have another question about the community impact statement um, and maybe in connection to Ideas Lab. Um, is there, it, it, my understanding was that it could be very broad um, in terms of what impact an applicant could envision. Um, I guess one example that was brought up, uh, EPO topics from broader impacts, uh, like, like NSF broader impacts, but it could also, what, what other examples might you give? And, and I guess the connected sub question in my mind is, do you think, um, and I, I guess I'm addressing it to Masao and Jim in partnership, uh, do you think that in the ideas lab, there would also be presentations 
that could give options for community impact to potential applicants. I, I, I can say a, a few things. So one of the other community impact things that I had in mind, uh, especially for LSST is software development and algorithm development. If your uh, science requires something that, you know, is specialized in some kind of analysis that has a wider use in the other science areas, I would uh, definitely count that as a community uh, impact contribution. Um, mm -hmm. But like you said, yeah, EPO activities and, and other, you know, non-technical uh, things are also um, part of that. We have a couple of questions for the audience. Jim, do you want to contact if any of this will be part uh, uh, com comment uh, for the Ideas Lab, but very briefly. Yeah, just, just briefly that, yeah, we're hoping to have a couple of presentations about sort of the science opportunities and also sort of the broader impact opportunities. So I, I think this is one of the things we'd like to have presented to give people sort of inspiration for their conversations. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, one question for Geno, I would say, for fellows outside the U.S., are the research allowances back to the U.S. dollar or will allowances be made for local currencies and local economies? Will cost of traveling to and from Chile for collaborative visits, um, uh, if they are included, the cost is very different for if you are in Europe or if you are in North America. So yeah, maybe so Jeno can take this. <clears throat> Yes, I can take it in the sense that I can say we have a task force that's called the logistics task force. And the primary goal of that task force is to deal with exactly this type of question, especially for international fellows. And most of the members of that task force are from outside the US because of the complexities related to seating fellows outside the US. So we will have answers, but we don't have them yet. And another question from the audience, we still have, maybe I'll take an extra minute. Given that Rubin LSST data will not be flowing at 100% rate during uh, year three, um, until year three of the first cohort, uh, will using that data uh, be important part of the research plan in the first cohort applications or would preparatory work uh, be also valued? maybe selection, I guess. Masao, what do you think? Yeah, I, I can comment on that. Um, I think absolutely preparatory work is extremely valued. And and I, I see this question came from Sarab, who wants to uh, study type 1A supernovae. And you know these are things that just cannot be done in the first year or two. And so any uh, study that's related to preparing for the science that will come out five years after uh, data acquisition starts um, will be definitely valued. Great. I don't see, oh, let me check Slack. Um, oh, yes, there was a question. I know that, but I would, um, I don't know if we can go. Are you concerned, I, I'll go ahead. Are you concerned that the timing of the ideas workshop will not be good for professors from small and teaching heavy institutions? Um, and Jim, can you give your quick answer? It's already on Slack as well. Yeah, I'll, I'll just say what I said there, which is just that, yes, we are concerned. We would like this to be as broadly available as possible. We did talk to a few people um, who work at smaller colleges and they said that Fridays for some of them are a lighter day. And so that was preferred over say like a Monday or a Wednesday. It's obviously not optimal. And same problem with caregivers and parents where weekends versus weekdays don't usually work. So we're hoping that Friday is the middle ground Okay, uh, thank you everybody. I will make one quick comment on the software development part in terms of community impact and our uh, potential applicants that the link connection, which uh, Jeno did mention, uh, will bring the fellows in contact with actual professional software engineers, thanks to the Schmidt Futures uh, initiative and support of the link initiative. So it doesn't mean that in order to be selected, you have to do software development, but you might have ideas for how to collaborate with the software engineers to eventually impact the community. So I'd like to also uh, make that comment. So with that, um, thank you everybody for attending. Uh, thank you, Amir, uh, for everything. And thank you, Jeno and the whole team. Bye-bye.